Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to do something different. Um, I would like all the missionaries to come to the stage here. Brothers and sisters, I want you to take a good look at this group of men and women here. And then look at the seat where you were sitting. The brothers and sisters that these men and women have left behind should take your seat in future meetings of this nature. Do you agree? Do you agree? The, the place that these missionaries have occupied there should be occupied by our fellow black brothers and sisters in theological education. There's, uh, there's a dependency on these guys in Africa that we need to get rid of. I know that's a very bitter pill to swallow. It's like sucking a malaria pill. <laughs> but I think Africans need to start rethinking. This is what we've been saying since the morning. Yeah, this is what we've been saying. And imagine if these guys were absent from this meeting. Would this meeting have happened? These guys have made this meeting happen. And these guys need to teach us how to make this meeting happen without them. Then we have grown. Then we have matured. Thank you. Please take your seats. I just want my fellow Africans to think seriously about this whole issue. Because there is a, a very heavy dependence on this group of people that were here. If they don't make these things happen, it seems like we don't have the guts, we don't have the resources. We were told this morning, we don't have the resources. We were told this morning, we don't, we, we're not ready. I don't know how far true that is. But I think Africa has the resources it's the management of those resources that has gone wrong. And we need to acknowledge where we are and why we are where we are. Why we are what we are. Why our theological institutions are where they are. We need to acknowledge our pitfalls, our misgivings, our shortcomings. The dependency syndrome is what's killing us in Africa. And if we continue like this until the Lord comes, shame on us. The issue of the authority of scripture is a very controversial issue, not only in Christianity, but amongst world religions. How authoritative is the Bible? I want to begin my presentation with a definition of authority. The Oxford Dictionary defines authority as legal or rightful power, a right to command or to act, power exercised by a person by virtue of his office or trust. It defines it as dominion, as jurisdiction, as authorization, the power derived from opinion, respect, or esteem, the influence of character, office, or station, or mental or moral superiority. It also defines it as a claim to be believed and obeyed. And I think those are fundamental concepts when we talk about authority. And when we begin to define the divine authority, in the Septuagint and the New Testament, Authority is sometimes translated by the word power, referring to the rightful and legitimate function of power. This authority is related to the position one holds without physical coercion or force. All authority can be determined to be intrinsic or delegated. 
What we mean by intrinsic is dominion exercised by a person or the office occupied by that person by virtue of being the sole creator of things, seen and unseen. God exercises dominion over all things. This intrinsic authority is only inherent in the Trinity. It is part of their nature and they cannot be detached from this manner of authority. That authority which is delegated is given by the only one who has intrinsic authority and whatever authority he delegates is to fulfill his perfect will and plan and the one to whom that authority is delegated is then obligated to fulfill a particular function towards the fulfillment of the will of God. How do we define scripture? The word scripture is derived from the word scribe, meaning to write, and is generally defined as anything written, a document, an inscription. Specifically, the word scripture to Christians is the books of the Old and New Testaments. Buckminster said, compared with the knowledge which the scriptures contain, every other subject of human inquiry is vanity. The concept of authority is thoroughly woven into the fabric of Scripture. It is unmistakably obvious from Genesis 1 verse 1 to Revelation 22 verse 20. Just how important is the authority of Scripture? In the Diet of Worms in April 1521, Martin Luther, under intense pressure to recant regarding justification by faith, and other recently embraced truths from the Bible responded to Meister Eck in this fashion. And Martin Luther said, Since then, your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply. I will answer without horns and without teeth. Unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. End of quote. Scripture does not possess extrinsic authority, but rather intrinsic authority. Thus, it is not a secular concept that has been co-opted by the Christian faith. On the contrary, it is a sacred element of the very character of God. What scripture presents as its basis for authority has purposely been distorted by this world system and wrongfully employed by all the world religions. I want to address very briefly a general view of authority. Illegitimate forms and expressions of authority range from the illegal and abusive exercise of authoritarianism, totalitarianism, to individual authority which emerges from a postmodern mindset of selfishness. Bernard Ram suggests authority itself means that right or power to command action or compliance or to determine belief or custom expecting obedience from those under that authority and in turn giving responsible account for the claim to right or power. The New Testament noun, which appears 102 times, most commonly translated authority is exousia. The, a representative lexical definition reads, the power exercised by rulers or others in high position by virtue of their office. There are many approaches to authority in the secular worldview. For example, and I'm going to give you five examples. Oligarchical authority is the authority exercised by a powerful few. Democratic authority is authority exercised by the people. Hereditary authority is that which is exercised by those in a particular family. Despotic authority is that which is exercised by one or more in an evil fashion. It, it's got its own characteristic. Personal authority is that which is exercised by one person. However, with a biblical worldview, 
original authority and ultimate authority reside with God alone. God did not inherit his authority, neither was it delegated to him. God did not receive his authority because there was no one from whom to receive it. God's authority did not come by way of an election because there was nobody to vote him into power. God did not seize authority because there was no one from whom to take it. God did not earn his authority because that would suggest an external source possessed that authority. Therefore, God inherently embodies authority because he is the great I am. In order for us to truly comprehend who God is, we have to comprehend his authority by which he exists without assistance from an external source. Let's talk about the authority of God. Those who engage in debates about the existence of God often ask these questions. Where did God come from? The answer is, he came from nowhere because there was no other source of life. Coming from nowhere, he stood on nothing because there was nowhere for him to stand. And standing on nothing, he spoke everything into existence. He, refer, he referenced everything from his own will. In his omnipotence, he called creation into existence in an orderly fashion. And there was no one to critique his workmanship. And that's why he gave his own critique and said, it is good. No commentary or critic would ever be better than those three words. Every time, every day that God created something, he referenced it by saying, it is good. The only time when God put a negative into that statement was when he said, it is not good for a man to be alone. That's why most of you are married. <laughs> to understand and accept the fact of God's authority is as simple as, as accepting the fact of God himself. Paul in Romans says this best. He says in Romans 13 and verse 1, For there is no authority except from God, and those, who ex those which exist are established by God. This declaration lays out clearly the source of all authority and articulates the principle of divine delegation. There are numerous statements in the Old Testament which explicitly testify to God's authority. For example, Psalm 62 verse 11 says that power belongs to God. And 2 Chronicles 20 verse 6 says, Power and might are in thy hand so that no one can stand against thee. Jesus declared in those very famous words, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. Jude wrote, To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. There is a need for us to study God's authority in theology. The names of God, for instance, and I... I'm just going to use 11 examples. The names of God reveal something about his character, especially his authority. A name is always tied into character, and character plays itself out in the things that we think, say, and do. The name Elohim, or God, tells us that he is supreme above all things and above all people. He is eternal, while all else is temporal. That's why the law of the basic law of science tells us that all matter disintegrates. He is the creator. All has been made by him. The name Jehovah or Lord occurs over 6,800 times in the Old Testament and speaks of God's eternal and unchanging nature. It literally means I am. And God used it to instruct Moses in Exodus 3 and Christ confronted and confounded the Pharisees with this name in John chapter 8. And you remember they were livid with him when he said, Before Abraham was, I am. 
El Shaddai, which means God Almighty, points to the invincibility of God and his omnipotence or all-powerfulness. Nothing is too hard for God and no enemy will ever defeat him. He is capable of doing all things. The name Adonai means master or Lord. In Deuteronomy 10 and verse 17, it indicates authority and ownership. Therefore, God deserves our worship, our loyalty, and our obedience because from him we have received our very existence as well as our eternal redemption in Christ. That's why the New Testament translates those words in Deuteronomy by saying, in him we live and move and have our being. The name Jehovah Jireh means the Lord is the provider. God substituted the sacrifice to replace Isaac in Genesis 22. The name pictures God as seeing and anticipating his divine provision of the right supply at just the right time. His omniscience and wisdom are put in proper perspective. Jehovah Rophi points to God as healer in Exodus 15. The shepherd's mercy and compassion and loving kindness show through this name. God's healing is to be understood both in the physical and spiritual sense. This is one of the things that Baptists have a problem with. Because Pentecostals have abused the issue of healing, Baptists have swung to the other side of the extreme and we don't believe in healing. We don't want to believe in the miraculous power of God to intervene in the affairs of man when it comes to healing. And that's why we say healing services are Pentecostal. Who said? What Bible are you reading? <laughs> Jehovah Mkadesh, which means the Lord who sanctifies. He stands as our redeemer and our sanctifier. The name reminds us that he abhors sin and will not have tolerance for sin. Jehovah Shalom in J Judges chapter 6. Gideon, for Gideon, the name signified the quality of peace which is central in God's nature. Jehovah Tzidkenu means Jehovah our righteousness. Jehovah Rohi means the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Shammah means the Lord is there. It describes God's presence to guide, protect, and make provision for our needs. There is need for our theological education to center the curriculum more on a deep study of scripture rather than man's interpretation of it. Our institutions are full of library books which expound with great emphasis the views of man and those which contain a thorough exegesis of scripture. If the best method of interpretation is scripture with scripture, it is my observation that we are not utilizing the Bible as our major resource for our knowledge of God. Observe the theological themes that saturate the names of God. Does your theological institution have a course on the names of God? No, it's mentioned in passing. It's one of those subjects that we just talk about in passing. The names of God really don't have the depth that we ought to afford to them. Yet very few institutions have made an in-depth study of the names of God, let alone take their students through that in-depth study of the true nature and the character of God. Yet we teach our students a lot of good theology, but it is, is it essential to them understanding the true nature of the authority our God really possesses. I want to challenge all of us to search the content of your school's academic programs. What dominates the content of what the students are learning? Are we producing more academics than men who are truly anointed to proclaim deep truths? Why is it that our pulpits are shallow? Why is there no unction in the pulpit? Because when there's no unction in the pulpit, there will be no function in the pew. If we believe that the Bible is God's word, 
and it carries a message from the heart of God, we must truly believe that those inspired words of Scripture testify to the total authority of God and that authority lies in the very nature of God. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, For the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. If the word of God is so powerful, why is there such a, a light emphasis on the power and authority of Scripture? It is the nature of God that gives us his word, that gives his word such penetrating power to the deepest core of man's being. The very nature of God displays his authority in that he is characterized as unapproachable light. And he is described in Romans 11 as unsearchable, in 1 Timothy 1 as immortal, in Isaiah 40 as inscrutable, in Romans 1 as incorruptible, in 1 Timothy 1.17 as invisible, and in Romans 11 again as unfathomable. The following non-communicable attributes of God pertain exclusively to his deity. They will never be experienced by anyone else. They speak of his authority, the authority of Scripture. It talks about his omnipotence in Jeremiah 32, his omniscience in Psalm 139, his omnipresence in Psalm 139, his immutability in Psalm 102, his sovereignty in 1 Chronicles 29, his eternality in Psalm 90, his greatness in Psalm 135, his self-existence in, in Isaiah 41. These following qualities find their ultimate expression in God. They describe the way in which God, in which his authority is ministered. God is described as wisdom in Romans 16. He's described as faithfulness in 1 Corinthians 10, as truthfulness in in Exodus 34, he's described as love in 1 John 4. He's described as goodness in Psalm 100, righteousness in Psalm 92, mercy in Psalm 86, compassion in Lamentations 3, holiness in Psalm 99, graciousness in Psalm 116, patience in 2 Timothy 3, peace in Hebrews 13, kindness in Psalm 100, gentleness in 2 Corinthians 10, joy in John chapter 17, forgiveness in Exodus chapter 34, and justice in Deuteronomy 10. The authority of God in Scripture must be searched thoroughly. The New Testament emphasis on veracity is most pronounced. It asserts that, the, that God is the true God and the God of truth. It asserts that his judgments are true and just, that a knowledge of God is a knowledge of the truth that Christ is the true light, the true bread, and the true vine, that Christ bears a true witness, that his judgments are true, that he is a minister of the truth, that he is full of truth, that he is personally the truth, he speaks the truth. The Holy Spirit is repeatedly called the spirit of truth. His ministry is to guide into the truth. The gospel of the Christian faith is called the word of truth. It is called the truth of Christ and the way of truth. And the Christians are said to have found the truth. And the heretic or the unbeliever have missed the truth. And the church is called the pillar and the ground of the truth. And therefore we should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to us once and for all. Scripture does not contain the word of God. It is the word of God. Both the ontological basis that God is and the epistemological basis that God speaks only truth are established in Scripture, in Genesis and in Psalms. John Frame succinctly asserts, there is no higher authority, no greater ground of certainty. The truth of Scripture is a presupposition for God's people. Close quote. 
Thus, the very nature of God and God's word is not determined inductively by human reason, but deductively from the testimony of Scripture in Psalm 119 and Isaiah 40. Scripture is the first and foremost the word of God, not the word of men. The phrase logos theou, the word of God, is found over 40 times in the New Testament. It is equated with the Old Testament. It is what Jesus preached. It was the message of the, that the apostles taught. It was the word the Samaritans received as given by the apostles. It was the message the Gentiles received as preached by Peter. It was the word that Paul preached on his first missionary journey. It was the message that Paul preached on Paul's second missionary journey. It was the message that he preached on his third missionary journey. It was the focus of the book of Luke that... that it was the focus of Luke in the book of Acts in that it spread rapidly and widely. And Paul was careful to tell the Corinthians that he spoke the word as it was given him from God and that he had not, it had not been adulterated and that it was a manifestation of truth. Paul acknowledged that it was the source of his preaching. The word, the word, the word. Carl F. Henry put forth his truth, this truth in the, div in the divine inspiration of Scripture in the clearest possible way. Carl F. Henry said, Inspiration is that supernatural influence of the Holy Spirit whereby the sacred writers were divinely supervised in their production of Scripture, being restrained from error and guided in the choice of words they used consistently with their disparate personalities and stylistic peculiarities. God is the source of Holy Scripture. Christ Jesus is the central message. The Holy Spirit is the one who inspired it and illumines it. Its message to the reader bears witness to the inscripturated word, to the word enfleshed, crucified, risen, and returning. Caliph Henry made that very important statement. And since the origin of Scripture can ultimately be explained by divine inspiration as defined above. Then the authority of scripture is directly derived from the authority of God. Those who do not take God's authority in scripture seriously are condemned in Jeremiah chapter 8 and in Mark chapter 7. On the other hand, those who rightfully honor and submit to God's authority in Scripture are commended in Nehemiah chapter 8 and in Revelation chapter 3. Therefore, the man of God, that is God's herald, is to preach the word of God. I hate to say this, but the term man of God has been abused. It's been dragged through the dirt. And it is a term that is used to convey that the so-called man of God has authority over the congregation. An authority that he doesn't deserve, neither is it an authority that he has been delegated by God. The supreme authority of God is asserted in two similar statements, one which is found in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and the other in the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 1. It is the phrase, in the beginning. In Genesis, it is followed by the name God. In John, it is followed by the verb of eternal existence, was. God is the only one that has the authority to say in the beginning. Why? Because he is the beginning. He's the only one that was there to declare a beginning. And the descriptive name of God called the word is used in the gospel of John. The in the beginning of Genesis is different from the in the beginning of John. In Genesis, Moses referred to the origin of time, namely the creation narrative. 
while John referred to eternity past, a classification scientist by the name of Herbert Spencer of the 19th century was awarded for discovering that everything can be summed up in five categories, namely time, force, action, space, and matter. What man hailed Herbert Spencer for discovering, God has preempted in the first ten words of the gospel according to Genesis, which reads, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. After analyzing those first ten words of scripture, we can put Herbert Spencer's so-called discovery to rest and bury it forever. In the beginning, that's time. God, that's force. Created, that's action. The heavens, that's space. And the earth, that's matter. What new thing did Herbert Spencer discover? Nothing. He was only repeating what God said. He just repeated it in a different way. So that is God's God asserting his authority in the first ten words of his authoritative word. John's gospel stands out from, from among the other three gospels in this manner. Matthew wrote to the Jews and therefore begins the genealogy of Jesus with the great patriarch Abraham to captivate the attention of his audience. Abraham was their religious authority but now a greater than Abraham had arrived, the word. Mark wrote to the Greeks and presented Jesus as the servant of God. The Greeks worshipped various gods and goddesses which they served, but now a greater servant was amongst them, the word. Luke, the medical doctor and historian, writes to the Gentiles and begins the genealogy of Jesus with Adam, the first man of the human race. Humanity looked to Adam as their federal head, but now a greater than Adam, the second or the last Adam, had arrived, and he was amongst them to heal man's history of chaos and calamity and catastrophe beyond all damage. All that had been caused by sin, and this servant was the word. John looks at those three Gospels and says, Matthew started with Abraham. Mark didn't bother to write about the genealogy of Jesus. Luke goes back to Adam. And John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes to the whole world and goes beyond the barrier of time and sees Jesus on the other side of creation in eternity and literally says, this is the final authority of all revelation and it is found in the person of Jesus Christ, the Word. It is not coincidental that there are 1,188 verses in the Bible and the middle chapter of the Bible is Psalm 118 verse 8. And it states categorically, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. This is the only chapter in all of scripture that begins and ends with the exact same words. And these are the words. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. If Jesus was in the beginning, prior to and at creation, that implies that there can be no other authority beside him who was, who is, and is to come. Throughout scripture, God acts in his inherent authority to call into existence something out of nothing, he commands and demands from all creation the order by which they must exist. He speaks through men by an emphatic four words, thus saith the Lord. And he speaks to all men and women to whom he alone delegates authority, revealing his will to both Jews and Gentiles. He gives custodianship of his word to his chosen people so that they can disseminate it to all the nations of the world. 
He holds, he holds men accountable for their own souls as well as for the souls of others. He patiently allows history to unfold while sovereignly fulfilling his divine purposes. He steps out of eternity into time in the person of Jesus and subjects himself to the agonizing death of a criminal on the cross, made a cross that was made from the tree which he himself created and, it is in pers- and is in pursuit of man's soul. He submits himself to the decomposition process to to demonstrate the corruption of man's body in accordance with the law of science, that all matter disintegrates. He defies all science and rises from the dead with the authority to take up his life again. He makes his post-Golgotha presence known to more than 500 witnesses, commissions his disciples to disseminate his teachings, ascends into heaven, and he takes up residence at the right hand of the Father, note, the right hand, and the only recorded time he stands from that right hand is when Stephen has spoken the word with tremendous authority and the Holy Spirit has convicted the listeners that they respond by a rock concert and they stone him to death. He stands up from his seat when Stephen is stoned to death. God's revelation to his chosen authors is dictated by the Holy Spirit through their pens as they inscribe the very word of God under the new covenant. And all of God's counsel is wrapped up in the great revelation of Jesus Christ as this book closes the canon of scripture with a deep desire for the coming of Jesus to eradicate sin and and evil and usher in an eternity of worship of the almighty God. It is not surprising, therefore, that God makes this declaration in Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Close quote. At the end of time, this is what must happen according to the scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24. Then comes the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Nobody can do that unless he is the ultimate authority. The authority of scripture in theological proclamation, the outworking of God's authority in scripture, must be summarized in these statements. It is not a derived authority bestowed by an external source. Rather, it is an inherent and original authority of God. Number two, it does not change with the times, nor is it subject to change, but rather it is an alterable authority of God. Number three, it is not one authority ranked among many possible spiritual authorities. Rather, it is the exclusive spiritual authority of God. Number four, it is not a temporary authority that can be successfully challenged. Rather, it is the permanent authority of the everlasting God. Number five, it is not a relativistic authority or subordinate authority, but rather it is the absolute and ultimate authority of an eternal God. Number six, it is not merely a suggestive or idealistic authority, rather it is an obligatory authority of God. And number seven, it is not a mild and placid indulgent authority in its outcomes, rather it is the resultant and consequential authority of God. The authority of scripture is horrendously eroded if the total divine inerrancy is in any way limited or discarded or made relative to a view of truth contrary to the Bible's own. It is therefore imperative that every theological institution has embedded in its statement of faith an uncompromised declaration of the authority of God in scripture and the authority of scripture in God. Students who enroll in our theological institutions to study 
must be made to understand that they are coming to an institution whose mandate is to declare the oracles of God without fear or favor, without fear meaning that there is no fear of losing enrollment numbers, without favor meaning that there is no bias towards a denomination's favorite traditional leanings which deviate from God's word. We must affirm that the Holy Scriptures are to be received as the authoritative word of God. We must, consequentially, we must consequently deny that the Scriptures receive their authority from the church, from tradition, or from any other human source. Our students are coming to our institutions with preconceived presuppositions about what we believe and how we behave. And that was mentioned in one of the earlier talks. Our students are coming to our seminaries with strong affiliations to the modern prophets who are false prophets. Their Facebook profile pictures are modern prophets. Their WhatsApp profile pictures are modern prophets. We must therefore affirm that the authority of Scripture cannot be separated from the authority of God. Whatever the Bible affirms, God affirms. And whatever the, whatever the Bible affirms or denies, it affirms or denies with the very authority of God. Such authority is normative to all believers. It is the canon or the rule of God. This divine authority of the Old Testament scripture was confirmed by Christ himself on numerous occasions in Matthew 5, Luke 24, John chapter 10. And what our Lord confirmed as the divine authority of the Old Testament, he promised also for the New Testament in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16. We also must therefore categorically declare that one cannot reject the divine authority of Scripture without hereby impugning the authority of Christ who attested Scripture's divine authority. It is wrong to claim that one can accept the full authority of Christ without acknowledging the complete authority of Scripture. Again, I quote Carl F. Henry, one of the leading 21st, uh, 20th century theologians who said, Without an authoritative scripture, the church is powerless to overcome not only human unregeneracy, but also satanic deception. Where the church no longer lives by the word of God, it is left to its own devices and soon is overtaken by the temptations of Satan and the misery of sin and death. In one of our discussions, we, we, we've been talking about how we as Baptists need to uh, address the issue of power theology in our churches and address the issue of power theology in our seminaries. That's the reason why people are coming to a Baptist church on Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon they're going to the prophets because our theology of power is not asserted. When they come with demons, we call it hysteria. We give it a scientific garb and we, we gown it with scientific terminology to hide the fact that we don't know how to deal with this problem. We don't know how to address power theology. Like the disciples, Peter, Paul, and Stephen, centuries ago, our minds also need to be captive to the divine authority of the word of God in our preaching as well as in our practices. Like the Berean wise men, we need to scrutinize analyze, criticize, and finalize the modern pulpit ministry by asserting the authority of Scripture before we accept the teachings that are disseminated. Those of us who are lecturers in our Bible colleges, are we sure that the, the stuff that we are teaching in the classroom is based on the authority of Scripture or is it based on my own interpretation, my own opinion, and my own view? Some of us want to be popular with our students. Let me remind you, God did not call you to be popular. He called you to declare truth. The purpose of the word of God is to reveal the character of God, to unveil the plan of God, and to declare the will of God. The permanence of the word of God is that it is his final revelation. It is his word for all time. It is his eternal possession. The power 
of the Word of God is seen in the various activities that we have in our, in our lifestyles. I was born on a farm. I was raised by a carpenter. My father was a carpenter, and I went to, to, to boarding schools, and I've been part and parcel of a lifestyle that has a lot of things incorporated into it. But let me take examples from my life, which I believe are also examples from your life, to describe the power of God's word. Like a sword, it pierces. Like a knife, it cuts. Like a nail, it penetrates. Like an oil field, it enriches. Like, like a fire, it purifies. Like a jack, it lifts up. Like a judge, it convicts. Like a shepherd, it leads. Like a wall, it protects. Like a sign, it guides. Like a mind, it discerns. Like a fountain, it refreshes. Like a stamp, it authenticates. Like a mirror, it reveals. Like a house, it shelters. Like a lion, it conquers. Like a wind, it transcends barriers. Like medicine, it heals. Like glue, it mends. Like water, it cleanses. Like man, it is human. Like a hammer, it, it breaks. Like an axe, it divides. Like a file, it sharpens. Like a mill, it crushes. Like a ruler, it measures. Like a spanner, it tightens or loosens. Like a prosecutor, it examines. Like a teacher, it instructs. Like a voice, it calls. Like a light, it shines. Like a mouth, it speaks. Like a well, it provides. Like a phone, it communicates. Like a magnet, it draws. Like a bed, it gives rest. Like a hoe, it cultivates. Like food, it nourishes. Like electricity, it empowers. Like honey, it sweetens. Like energy, it enables. Like God, it is divine. Allow me to conclude. The challenge for modern theological education is multifaceted. What subjects do we teach our students? And how do those subjects impact the lives of the students enough to impact their congregations and ultimately the communities in which they serve? Which subjects are more relevant to their individual and ministry contexts? Sometimes we're teaching our students stuff that they will never use because it's irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything to them. They're just polite enough not to tell you that you're wasting their time. <laughs> Would it help to have a course or courses, for example, where they learn to do a thorough exegesis of one of the books of the Torah from Genesis to Deuteronomy? One book of the major prophets, one book of the minor prophets, the book of Proverbs. Hey, that one is rich. It's a gold mine. One of the Gospels, the book of Ephesians, which covers the doctrine of the church. One of the pastoral epistles and the book of Hebrews. Would it hurt to include that in our curriculum? Do we need to have a more biblical or Bible-centered curriculum? that centers on thorough explanations of certain books of the Bible to give our students a more thorough understanding of the message of Scripture? Or is our current curriculum sufficient to meet that need? I want us to go back home to our respective countries and to our respective institutions and consider the content of our curriculum. How effective is it? Or are we just doing things out of an attitude that says, well, we're here as a theological institution, we're here to train people, and we're graduating 65 people this year, and we're content with numbers. These are some of the questions that we have to wrestle with as we consider the direction of our theological education the impetus provided by our theological educational content somewhat determines and strongly influences the impact our students will have on our churches and the influence our churches will have on our communities. The question of relevance demands that we search the content of our curriculum to see whether or not it is really making a difference in our churches. We may be producing academics 
who know so much about theology without necessarily knowing how to apply that theology to practice within their ministry context. You see, the people in our churches and the people in the world out there, they, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if the students don't know how much you care for them by the curriculum that you give them, look, I'm being honest here. I was a student once. And I'm back to the same college where, where I was brought up theologically 33 years ago. And I had to question some of the subjects that I did. And I said to myself, are these things relevant? Am I, am I going to use this stuff? And for some years, I moved from house to house carrying boxes of material that I brought from the seminary, which I never used. Eventually, I burnt all the stuff. I made a fire in winter. The book of Proverbs says in chapter 22 and verse 6, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Allow me to maybe, in some of your opinions break the laws of hermeneutics a bit. But a similar principle applies to theological education. Train up a, a called and spirit-filled student biblically for the context in which he will minister, and when he is in the field, he will not depart from the principles of Scripture. I close my case. 